people are more visual than they are data driven. Like 75% of people are not spatial. So like when they want to buy a home or see a condo, when they look at a 2D plan, right? Some people can visualize it, but most people can't. Okay, guys, welcome to Bloomex podcast. Um, today, we have a great shout out to mention. Um, shout out to MCRO for becoming a continuing sponsor for the, for the podcast. So this episode and a future episodes is going to be brought to you by MCRO, who enables businesses to grow through handcrafted digital solutions of the future. MCRO is a web and mobile app development studio with a competent, dedicated, and experienced team focused on solving business challenges through fast to market and producing high performance digital products. If you're looking to turn your destructive ideas into reality or have a reliable strategic tech partner to explore options with uh, for your existing work or for new work, reach out to us and we'll make the introduction for MCRO and you can have the conversation over a coffee or a bone shaker IPA, your choice. Okay, James, how are you doing? Doing great, good right. day to be alive. Perfect, um, you're here to talk about 3D cityscapes, right? Um, I, I know you through J J Raza. Wow, Raza. I'm losing track of everyone's names today. This is our fourth back-to-back -back episode, sorry. Awesome. Right, so Raza, um, I knew him for a long time and bumped into you guys at a booth at, um, I think, OPN's pitch, pitch night, mm -hmm. right? And um, yeah, got a, you got a chance to reconnect with Raza and uh, see what, what you guys are up to. Really surprised when, um, you know, I, I saw that, uh, what the project Reza was up to because he was doing something completely different before. Yes. All right, and we haven't caught up in a while, and now he's in a startup, and it feels like everyone's in startup world now, and it's great to see those familiar faces. But uh, with you, man, uh, you came from a music background, and now you're part of like this whole design and a programming team here, uh, program requirements required here to build this. You just develop on your own, right? You taught yourself this. Exactly. Yeah. So let's backtrack and talk about three D cityscapes, and we'll talk about that journey you took to build this, right? So. Um, what is it? And uh, you have it up running right now, right? Exactly. It's running off your own computer that you brought in. Yes. What's going on? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So exactly a year ago, uh, yeah. Raza and I met in New York and uh, we had an immediate connection. We just like immediate friendship. Yeah. You, know, you meet those people and you just have this energy level and there's a huge amount of energy level. We mm -hmm. met at a trade show. I was a business development manager mm -hmm. for a company which was doing interactive software and he was had his own startup company, which he started six months before. So we met and came together. Yeah. And shortly after we both got back to Toronto area, mm. we called each other and we had like a three hour conversation. And our visions lined up so, I mean, it was eerie how much they yeah. lined up, right? I started sharing with him the vision of what I wanted to do. And he said he had the same vision. And mm. it was just like magical how this vision lined up. So our, our whole idea was eventually to use video game technology okay. to create whole interactive cityscapes so that everybody around the world could benefit from having a 3D interactive, hyper-realistic experience, right? So imagine before you move to Toronto, let's say you're in China, let's say you're in India, let's say you're in the Middle East and you want to move to Toronto. Imagine you can get on your computer and you could actually walk the streets of Toronto and experience what Toronto is mm -hmm. before you come here, right? Okay. Not only that, imagine you have a, a VR headset. You could slap that VR headset on and actually experience that walking and moving around Toronto so you can experience it, right? Yeah. So that kind of experience, this is what we wanted to give. Immediately after Raza and I started talking, Raza said, man, I grew up playing SimCity. I'm like, I did too. Yeah. So we both connected on the SimCity level and that's what we basically wanted to create is a really hyper-realistic cityscape so that people could enjoy this experience and walk around, right? And have that experience before coming here. Perfect. Perfect. I mean, nothing's better than when two people are come together and uh, are aligned towards a common pur pur uh, purpose. Because like, when, you have, when you're bugged by this idea, when you have this vision of uh, what you want to build, you're an entrepreneur, right? It's really a struggle to get other people to follow you sometimes. Yes. Right to find co-founders, to find supporters, to find investors, and that uh, that frustration can start lingering uh, because you want to so desperately move on your up idea or project. You don't necessarily know how, or doesn't have, don't necessarily have the means uh, to be able to find somebody that they can gel with. So you guys both had similar idea, yes, and you brought you together to build this. So let's talk more about the three D cityscapes. Okay, 
Can we uh, can we uh, take this for sure. on our run and Let's see what's it going on? Test drive. Yeah. Let's do it. So what I'm going to show you here is actually the we started off modeling the lower tip of Manhattan in New York, okay. and then we added 100 by 100 kilometers of the entire city. So how do you do the modeling? Yeah, so the modeling is all based on open street maps. So mm -hmm. we use the same system that Google uses. It places all the streets, everything exactly how they are, and also it gives us the elevations of all the buildings. So they're actually to scale elevation wise. What you're gonna see here is the lower tip of Manhattan has been designed in ultra realistic views, whereas the rest of New York is in a volumetric schematic view, okay? And the reason for that is basically, it takes a while to do this. So okay. if you were to do the entire New York, at this quality, it's gonna take quite a bit to do. Oh, so wow. You can see here. That's so much more to do. Yeah, there's a lot to do. <laughs> That's kind of cool. So. I'm trying to get this straight. So this data, where does it come from? The modeling data? like. So this data came partly the roads and the streets, the placements of all the buildings, the actual cool. elevations came from open street maps. Yeah. And then we have a modeling team that does the modeling and places those models in Unreal Engine. So do you guys have to do this individually per building? Yes, or is it each building needs to be done individually and then we build it into the map. Cool, and who does the actual data collection for the model? Like, is that a third party company that have done this already and they're you're get, getting access to? Like, So there are some models that are available. Like we have additional models that we're gonna be plugging in yeah. to this, but a lot of it is done internally where we get the actual outline and framework of the building and then yeah. our modelers will actually model and design these buildings, right? How they look. And the best way is if we get the architectural plans from the developers. If they give us the architectural yeah, plan, yeah. then we can build everything exactly how it's gonna be in real life. That wow. is a hyper-realistic view. Yeah, yeah. So what's unique about our software is we can show the future, right? So let's say suddenly there's gonna be two buildings that are knocked down in 2025. We can show that and we can show the new building how it's gonna be placed in the city. For property developers, that's very powerful because now they can showcase this is what the building's gonna look like in the future, this is what's coming. And also it starts their sales cycle much sooner, you know, before then what it would start. Normally they have to set up a sales office, they'd have to set up a demonstration, build a physical model. Now we can show it in VR, we can show it in our 3D interactive software. Yeah. That gives them the opportunity to start selling those units sooner than later. This is crazy because I, I know what you mean by being like, like uh, Sin City, um, Sim City. Right, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, there's yes. Sin City, Sin City, and, and Sim, Sim City. City yes. <laughs> but um, we will model Sin City one day. Oh, yes, awesome, for sure. But uh, no, man, this is this is awesome because for playing with data and see, visualizing these kind of things, right? Like uh, what humans' effects are on on the physical world and planning these things. It's really hard to conceptualize for most people yes. from those like engineering specs how things are gonna look and change. But what I'm really interested about is like, kind of like SimCity or like those city builder games, could you get like real time analytics in there? Like how much water is going, you know, from IoT sensors, how much water is going through per building? What is the stress load, exactly. right? Uh, le what does electricity le grid look like? Like touch all the actual nodes and provide an actual si real time simulation? Yes. And so you've actually touched on our, some of our future stuff. So that's amazing. I'm sending that out to our competitors now. Oh, I'm just no. kidding. Yeah, of course. So that's our goal is to actually yeah. integrate all this information about the city so that we yeah. have a smart city mm. simulation where you can actually know what is the foot traffic coming by all these buildings, mm. how much traffic we can tie into Google uh, uh, traffic API and actually show the animated traffic, right? We can show for net zero energy buildings, how that energy is being consumed and reused in the building, how much energy are the solar panels generating, you know, to offset the regular electricity consumption. So we have a plan to do that where we're actually gonna create that real-time tracking of a city, right? And put that in the cloud so everybody will be able to have access and see that information. And also wow. the cities will be able to use that for planning, Property developers can use that for their property developments. Different developments around the city will be able to measure it in real time to see, okay, this is what makes sense. Right? I mean, it's amazing. Um, I listened to a lot of uh, content by um, the A16Z podcast mm -hmm. uh, by Anderson Horowitz. And 
literally one of the partners uh, on the front company now I've been following for a long time. Um, he was talking about how games are the new platforms. Exactly. Kind of like how social media was like a platform for people, you know, for, for how, how, it's, how that's been changed the world. Um, gaming itself is becoming a platform where the actual specs used can be utilized in things, systems like this exactly. where you're connecting different people. But for you, you're really connecting a lot of data sources in a ways that people can visualize and, you know, estimate right, right off the bat, right? Like, like, I always think about that too. Like, pl I, I played the same game, SimCity, yes, right? Like, exactly. city builders, I used to love them. And one of the coolest things is like how easy it was to, to like plan growth and move people around and like, Part of that fun is like how to create an ideal city, and yes. you could do that because you got these real-time analytics. And growing up, look back and it's like, why can't it be that simple, right? Yes, exactly. Why can't problems be solved pretty quickly like that? Like, you can plan and move forward. It's, so it's really cool. Um, what are your steps to to get there? Yeah. So our steps to get there, our next steps is, you know, now it's becoming possible to have these hyperlistic, realistic views because the internet has gotten much faster, right? We have yeah. the 5G networks are coming up all over major cities across the world. And now your technology, right? There's so many online, massive multiplayer games online like Fortnite, World of Warcraft, Black Desert, uh, Overwatch. So all these systems that are being used like that, we're actually building a similar gaming system to run our platform where it's going to be able to handle the stress loads of millions of users, right? Mm. So people will be able to actually log online and have this hyper-realistic view. Our goal is to make it so real that they can't really tell the difference between the environment that they're in and coming there in real life. Of course, it's never going to get to that point, but our goal is to make it as realistic as possible, right? Yeah. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Ready Player One, yeah. but that movie is a, is a testament to what's coming, right? That movie was placed in 2045, I believe, yeah. but we're actually getting there much sooner. The mm. technology right now is going so fast that are, we're actually going to be to that point, I think, by 2025, mm -hmm. right? They have half suits now where you can wear the entire half suit and have a, a, a VR experience, right? With touching, with feelings, with, uh, you know, even with smells they have too, and you wear the headset and everything. Yeah. So our goal is to be on that cutting edge of technology where we're driving the experience, not only just doing cities, but we want to drive the experience of ultra- VR, right? What I'm calling ultra VR, where you have such a hyper realistic experience, it's 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 memorable, right? Right now, VR, not everybody likes VR because yeah. you get a little bit nauseated sometimes. But as the experience gets better and the technology gets better, that experience is going to get better. So we want to be on that cutting edge of pushing that experience so that you can have a, a better experience. You know, a lot of people coming from foreign countries right now, they just have to jump on a plane, mm -hmm. right? get their tickets and just come here and they just jump into it. They don't know, right? But imagine they could plan everything and actually walk around the city, go into buildings, check out apartments, check out where they want to work. Get Buy that things. Exactly. Right. right. Meet people, right? Yeah. Imagine they could meet people that are living in Toronto that are also in this VR cityscape and they could actually meet and interact with people and talk about what do I have to do, right? Imagine how that could help them plan their visit. It's like a, it's like a digital game. layer on top of society. Exactly. That just makes things transparent. Exactly. Um, and actually transactable yes in a way right that's uh, that's really cool yeah all right so it's like, exciting to be part of that right we've we've also talked about creating a mall yeah you know malls where people can get online and actually shop right imagine come shopping in toronto from all around the world yeah right? like amazon like actually but like in real life right? exactly in 3d right, right. where you're actually the universal mall in 3D. yes right where exactly. everything is there that you can see that's that's ambitious plan yeah that's really cool ambitious. Um, so uh, I just want to digest that, right? So with VR, like something you touched upon, like VR right now, it's being a lot of hype. It's getting a renaissance, but like yes. the a concept of virtual reality and those headsets and has been around since, the, since like almost the sixties, Yes. right? It's been going through about, I think like seven iterations of where the hype has grown, exactly. where people think that the technology is there for actual VR takeoff. And then, it, and then like it busts, right? And then over a few years, every few years, come, keep coming back up into the, um, into the mainstream. This time around, it's different because we actually have the hardware capability to run these complex environments, at least somewhat, somewhat good quality. Yes. Um, so you can actually make them into games. And 
um, AR AR headsets and VR headsets that can like be uh, they can like you can play games with and interact with other people with. But you're thinking in within like in the next in the next five years, the technology be enough that it'll be immersive enough to have an actual virtual reality experience outside of traditional life. Yeah, I I believe it's getting to that point. I mean, there's VR games now like the Elder Scrolls, right? I yeah. downloaded. And the great, great thing about this is yeah. I have to test all these nice. games, right? This get that is excuse, part of my job. Right? Yeah. It is a good yeah. excuse. So I get to test all these, you know, yeah. these things. Are, are you I, a gamer? Do you play well, games? When I was a kid, that was when I was 12 years old, I used to play these role-playing games mm -hmm. um, on the PC, right? I had an old 33 megahertz yep. uh, DC uh, computer. Mm -hmm. And I used to play like King's Quest, Quest for Glory, all these different games, right? When the first Mist came out, I don't know if you may remember that. Okay. But I actually wanted to design computer games when I was younger. Mm. And it's just crazy that it's all came back, that yep. I'm, actually, I'm actually doing programming in Unreal Engine 4 now and helping you know design and give guidance to the designs of these cityscapes and buildings so it's exciting to be part of that it's very exciting and playing the games seeing where it's at now it would be amazed right i could show i could show you four or five applications in vr where you just you wouldn't want to stop playing it's so immersive and so it, the experience is so good that's what i know that that next step is coming over the next five years where a lot more people are going to invest in vr because it's getting to that next level for yeah sure Greater technology is becoming cheaper, right? Yeah. So they actually have eye placements in the in the some of these VR headsets where they can track your eyes. So let's say you go into a unit, right, a new apartment that's being built, and you end up looking at the floor fifty five percent of the time. It actually tells on the back end this person looked at the old flooring fifty four point four percent of the time. He looked at the kitchen cabinet seventy three point six. He looked at the countertops yeah. sixteen point eight, and he looked at the bathroom and the kitchen eight percent, and the bedrooms ten percent. It yeah, actually yeah. tracks your eye movement. So technology's gotten to that point now. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if, when you're interacting in these VR in environments, it knows not just what you're looking at, but but use that like um, tactically. You know, yes. That information we use tactically by an organization for understanding what's going on in that environment. Yes, right? exactly. Whether you're interested in that, or maybe you're something that needs to be fixed or a flaw, right? Yeah. So. Exactly. We've, we've had people approach us about HVAC systems, right? Mm. Or doing security certification. Right now, people go to a building to certify that the fire extinguishers are done. The HVAC's been tested out. It's all been checked. But when these you know people get there to evaluate it, they have a 2D map, right? It takes them hours sometimes just to figure out where everything's at. So people ask us, can we use your 3D model so that they can actually go in and see exactly where they're at? It'll save them time, right? Yeah. And we said, yeah, this is a great application. We just talked, we're talking to another company that's doing a VR headset program for firefighters. And mm -hmm. they're like, we need you to build a building where our firefighters go inside and extinguish this fire, right? Because they don't have the capability to build the buildings, but we do. Yeah, so yeah. we're talking to them about creating a building where they can go in and fight this fire in VR and actually get that experience without having to go in in real life first, right? Yeah, and definitely. That thing, right? Where they test their skills and test their reflexes, test their knowledge of putting out the fire, right? It could be multiple Many, so many case scenarios for yeah. learning and, and discovering in VR. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's great. I mean, I can definitely see the uh, like the countless applications. Yes. Where are you guys focusing on right now? I know you talked a lot about real estate. Yes. Is that really the market that you're focusing on right now? So what we're doing right now, we have a huge undertaking. Um, we're actually designing the entire GTA. It's actually the mm -hmm. entire Golden Horseshoe. Nice. So we have a model right now, which is 200 by 200 kilometers okay. of the entire Golden Horseshoe. And this is where we're first focusing at. We did the New York model first just to show what we we're capable of. But we decided let's develop the entire GTA because this is our, our home, right? This is our, our background here. So let's develop this area first and let's develop it with the best technology mm -hmm. and the, the most hyper-realistic experience. And then our goal is to take that to every major city across the world once we do it here first. It's amazing. So we actually have a base model now of the entire GTA that we're starting to work with. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, but... So, uh, yeah, I see the data applications of this, right? When you get more and more data and you can get, upload this and create these more and more fanciful models. Because with, like, a gaming engine like this, it's Unreal Engine 4, you said? Exactly. It's running for, like, it can do a lot of things, like like f fluid mechanics and all that, right? And understanding yes. how things move in a VR world, like, 
You can you can actually figure out how air f- will flow in HVAC systems. So exactly right, like you're this is not just like a virtual world to see, to see how things will look like, but can actually test real world functionality. Yes, right. How better to like distribute heat within an environment, or p- put air pump air fresh air through an environment, yes. or. And there's actually I'll give you an example. So mm-hmm. one of our first uh, contracts is with the city of Pickering. Mm-hmm. And City of Pickering, as you maybe may know, is developing mm. very quickly. So we're yeah. actually modeling um, three major buildings. I mean, they're going to be the tallest, one of the tallest buildings in Pickering. Okay. And we're developing their city center core area, right? It's a big city block of where all these developments are happening. But after that, we are also been talking with them about the international airport. There's been an international airport proposed for out in Pickering. Yeah. And so we're going to be actually able to develop that in 3D. We can show the sound, right? Like how is the sound of those planes going to affect mm. the neighborhood, right? Yeah. You can actually see it. You could travel as the planes come in and actually hear the sound at those different areas and check how is that sound going to impact the neighborhood? What do you have to do to put sound barriers, right? How is the economy going to be affected by this international airport? How many jobs is it going to bring to the local area? That's and amazing. how much income is it going to bring to Pickering, right, as a city into that area? How much is it going to help with the load of all the international travel that's happening at Toronto Pearson, right? How much are they going to be able to use that airport? So there's so many different applications, right? There they is. have a hospital that they want to put up in the future as well. So if we were able to model a hospital and show how that's going to impact the area, how it's going to help out, how these people are going to have access to a faster you know, ambulance, if that ambulance comes to this hospital, we can show all those effects. They also have a tour bus, right? They have a tour they're starting. They want us to show how the tour bus is going to take people around the city and how it picks them up and showcases all the, the citizens, all the different things that are happening around Pickering. So we could actually can show that in virtual reality. Yeah. So it gets them excited to have come in and have the real experience, right? It's all about driving the real experience. And not just that, like I just took in like, <laughs> as you can give it, as the city's going to be putting up more and more IoT sensors, and the environments, um, they're already looking into like what needs to be done for autonomous driving functionality. As those sensors go online, you can literally have 3D mappings of real-time sensory data. Exactly. Traffic flows, and how it traffic is moving, pedestrians crossing, all this kind of information can be now virtualized, and and you can like plan according to that. But exactly, like as a population, we're. You know, this in North America, this is the fastest growing area in North America in the Golden Horseshoe, right? And in the next, they say next 20 years, I think it's going to be 15 to 12 years. They say our population is going to grow 4.5 million more people, right? In the Golden Horseshoe. So what, Sorry, in how many years? In they say twenty years, but yeah. I think it's going to happen in more like twelve to fifteen. Right? Jeez, it's growing so fast, right? Yeah. That's why the economy is still growing. You know, uh, uh, realty is still growing up. So how are we going to deal with this, right? How are we going to deal with the impact of so many people, right? We already have housing issues right now, right? Those things are coming up. Traffic issues are coming up. How are we going to deal with these issues unless we use technology to solve those problems, right? So also we want to be, we want people, we want cities and governments to use our technology to simulate what's coming so that they can better plan for that in the future, right? Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Uh, What about security issues? I mean, having the wrong people kind of access this could be detrimental, right? So yeah, that's, that's a really good question, right? All the stuff that we work with is all public information anyway. Okay. So it's all public. And if a city or municipality or a government wants to have certain information uh, only for them, then that would only be within their skin. So what's really neat about Unreal is you can have unlimited possibilities. You can have multiple skins running off the same application. So there could be a certain application for the city, say, that they have special information they use for planning that they don't want to be released to the public because it's sensitive information. Gotcha. So that information would be secure. They would utilize that information. They would use it for their planning, yeah. but only certain information would be released to the public. Absolutely. So we have that ability to have multiple applications running within one master application. Uh, have you looked into Open Data Toronto? Uh, yes, I yeah. have. There's a lot of information on there. In yeah, fact, uh, we met with Toronto Global the other day, Amazing. which is uh, responsible for foreign direct investment, and they had pointed us to that data as well. They use a lot of that data for helping bring foreign direct investment into Toronto. So no, absolutely, it's amazing. amazing. Yeah, amazing data source. Yeah, so uh, Lawrence Etta, who is now the CTO of the City of Toronto, he was yes. on our podcast actually. Oh, wow. And uh, we talked about this, how the city wants to, uh, to have an open, transparent data policy. 
Yes. But uh, you know, not a lot of people can do much with it. I even looked. I looked through myself, and like, you still need some kind of understanding of uh, little data science to yes. be able to piece all this data together to do anything with it to actually manipulate it. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Um, if you guys can make it more visual and more appealing and easier to access, I think it'd be very beneficial to a lot of people. Exactly. Right. Who are want to build application on top of your initial platform. Right. Well, now, would you be open to a platform play like that? Or? Yeah, we're we're definitely open, man. It's there's a huge amount of possibilities with this. We're yeah. open to having partners in this as well, and we mm -hmm. welcome that. You know, because there's going to be so many avenues where this can go to, mm -hmm. right? Like people have even asked us for video games. Oh, can we use your Toronto model? You know, can we run like a Fortnite Toronto or Overwatch Toronto or whatever? And, we're like, and how easy is that to do? Yeah, it's not difficult. Once you have the 3D models in place, especially yeah. all of our stuff we're building in 8K. So yep. it's going to be ready for 8K. Amazing. Uh, it's not difficult to do that, right? Yeah. We don't want to get into the video game per se, but we're open to see, right? If it makes sense. So. No, absolutely. Uh, but like, what talk about rendering. I mean, it's got to, if you're rendering an 8K, a fully dynamic model like this, I mean, it's got to take a serious uh, computing, right? It does, yeah, it does. Fortunately, what we're doing is yeah. like most multi-online player games now is they create a settings interface. So depending on what you're working with, if it's if it's your phone or a tablet or a regular laptop or a full-blown gaming laptop like we brought here today, then your graphics will be mm -hmm. you know rendered based upon your machine. And we have to build it. We can't build it such a high quality that everybody is forced to use that. And now you've precluded 90% from not yeah. being able to use it. So we're building it open-ended so that it's going to adjust to the equipment that it's being built on. And the quality will be basically dependent on what you're using to view it on, whether it's your smartphone, yeah. tablet, laptop, or gaming computer. Well, have you looked into like um, cloud uh, computing, like uh, running it yourselves? Right, rendering everything yourself. Some yeah. people just access it depending on the bandwidth of their connection. Exactly. Connection speed. So Google Stadia, right? Yeah. Stadia is amazing, is amazing. Yeah. platform that's you know coming out. There's some great offers too. I've already pre-signed up. Oh yeah. To check it out. Yeah. So this could go on Stadia. It could. It could. It just it depends because right now Google Stadia has an individual charge, right? So yeah. if you want to have Stadia, you have to pay for it, right? And we want to keep this free as much as possible so people, as many people will be able to use it as possible. But there is that option to put it on like a Stadia platform or other platforms because the cloud storage is so cheap now, right, to run it. Yeah. And now you can run super gaming computers in the cloud and it's affordable. So that definitely will be an option for people who want to have the most realistic, you know, hyper experience possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. No, definitely. Like Stadia has been a project I've been watching for a long time. Like yeah. for anyone that's unfamiliar, it's like a gaming um, platform developed by Google. It's coming out coming out soon. Exactly. Where you can run like full HD graphics, like compu uh, computing um, games through their remote servers exactly. and through your phone, through any yeah. device any really, platform. any platform, any yeah. device. They run the all, the software for you. You're just accessing it. So all you need is um, a strong Wi-Fi signal. You're exactly. only limited by your connection, your bandwidth. Exactly. You travel, you go to a hotel, you're staying in Las Vegas or New York or somewhere around the world, you can just access it right there, right? Wherever your good internet connection is and you can continue your gameplay, right? No, definitely. So there's a lot of professional gamers out there now, so it's important to them to have these type of systems in place. So. Right, absolutely. And that's, uh, yeah, so... Um, what's next for you guys? Like, so you, you guys are paying customers. Do you guys have like this being demoed? Like what, what stage are you guys at? So right now we're, yeah, we have cities that are paying customers and also property developers. And like we said, I'm, I'm, mm. don't mind, I'll show you just the beginning of GTA. Yeah. Let you guys have a sneak preview of that. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. This thing's mind blowing. Like the potentials of it. Yeah, there's so many so many potentials yeah and that's why you know we have a great team of ad advisors nice. um, wonderful um, so this is actually a 200 by 200 amazing kilometer entire map of the yeah. golden horseshoe as I was saying earlier I've actually traveled this for about 18 hours now and I've all, not even covered 5% of it mm -hmm. So our goal is actually to make it so you can walk the streets of all the different parts of Toronto. Yeah. You can have the flying mode where you're flying at about 120 miles an hour. Have the driving mode where you can drive and also have like a boat mode where you can 
swim around yeah. in the water and experience. So these are the base models. These are all based on OpenStreetMaps. Mm -hmm. And uh, this gives us the elevations as well as the placements of the building and all the streets exactly where they are. So all the elevations are to scale, um, but the buildings still have to be shaped. So what we're doing right now is our, we're developing the more realistic models, uh, starting downtown Toronto, and also with different cities that are signing on board. And then we're starting to de develop our cloud-based platform so that this will be accessible in the cloud by everyone around the world. And this is really exciting because it's going to bring a level of technology to Toronto, right? Toronto is getting to be seen one of the major cities in the world, right? There are some big propositions right now for Toronto like a lot of people don't know but Justin Trudeau actually offered the UN to change their headquarters their global headquarters from New York to Toronto he's really? willing to give them 60 acres of the waterfront right next to sidewalk Toronto downtown on the waterfront and it's going to cost 4.5 billion dollars to make that development he's actually offered to build that all free of cost because it would actually bring like 14,000 people to Toronto and generate like $1.6 billion a year in income. Sorry, for this, this is for which company? This is for the United Nations. The United yeah, Nations? This actually was proposed in 2000, I think 17 or 18. It's amazing. Wow. Right? So there's some big things happening in Toronto. You know, big things happening here. We have Sidewalk Labs, right? Sidewalk Toronto is a 12-acre development right yep. on the waterfront. Yep. It's a huge development. It's going to be the smartest city or village in the world that's already been accepted, right? Yeah. And it's being built right now. It's starting to be uh, un unveiled, and they're going to start the developments next year on that. It's amazing. That's amazing. So we want to be able to showcase all that stuff and at the same time showcase the city and just make it, you know, make it uh, – realistic enough that people can, like, as we said, start using this for their planning, for tourism, for property development, for safety, security, for showing what the future is going to be, right? Mm -hmm. So how scalable is this? Like, how, how much, uh, like, effort goes into building these models? Sure. So these base models, we basically have the ability now to put up base models like this for any major city in the world. It only takes us about seven to 10 days to do, like, something like this for every major city in the world. Our technology is developed enough. Yeah. And right now we're going to be implementing AI into our system. So we're going to be teaching AI what we do manually so that it can start doing building those base structures and actually using scan data where we can go around the city. You see the Google cars driving and the Apple cars driving scanning. So we're actually going to have scanners where we scan information mm -hmm. and it converts those scans into 3D. And then we're going to use AI to start layering and texturing buildings, right? What we would normally do, you know, manually, we're going to have AI start learning and be able to do that on its own as well. So wow. we're also incorporating that into our system as part of our development too. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, that's going to be really exciting. Because yes. uh, just that growth rate to get to that point where you have like your own fleet going around getting real time data back, exactly helping model things. Yeah, imagine you know like your vacuum cleaner, your auto vacuum cleaner yeah, yeah. in your office. Let's say you want to have your building mapped inside so people can have a VR tour of your building. We'll actually have those little robots traveling around scanning, and then once they get completed, they'll report back to us and give us those scans so that we can put those into our framework and you'll that's, be able to, now your whole building's mapped, right? That's quite a fe uh, future. Exactly. When do you think, uh, do you think those kind of machines will be allowed on the road? Like, how would that um, work? Yeah, I think it'll it'll probably, oh my, our virus protection's up to date here. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> right, update it. <laughs> I think it'll happen, uh, uh, you know, it's a good question. Um, how soon that'll that'll happen right now there's manual cars that people drive around for google and for apple yeah. but i think those those things are going to be on the road where they're automatic self-driven soon sooner than later right yeah you know, that's what everything's moving towards yeah exactly exactly yeah, yeah. um okay Let, let's talk about like so you, you talked about scalability you're training ai sure. to actually help model this for you so you can feed more and more data to exactly. it exactly and I can learn how to integrate all this stuff into. Um, how big is your team right now? Like, uh, What's it looking like? Yeah, so there's about 10 people on our main team right now. Yeah. And then we've actually have uh, outreach to 38 different uh, Unreal developers around the world. So we mm -hmm. strategically manage a network of Unreal developers around the world that we can tap into as we learn and grow. Yep. And then our team's going to be developing uh, 
into the actually next year, January, February, we have a plan to probably bring on about three or four more people onto our core team and then start developing that more and more. So what's important to us is that we have that ability to scale and grow. That's why we've kept an outsource team and also our internal team, because we realize at any given time when people get more and more excited, we have to be able to scale quickly, right? We can't have a 10 projects come on at once and not be able to do that. So exactly. We kept our outsource team very healthy and also our internal team is very solid so that we have that ability to scale when needed. Plus there's so many video game developers around the world, right? I mean, this is like a, a just a crazy thing that's happened where all these kids now are graduating, you know, and they're trying to find jobs. And yep. now we, we give them the ability to use their video game skills and Unreal Engine and modeling, but actually apply it to a real life like scenario, right? So that's so really exciting. We actually have five interns right now from T Centennial College. Oh, wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, great. Do you have your own space? Like where are you guys operating out of? Yeah. So we're right near the 401 and 404 uh, on Consumers Road. Okay. So yeah. A nice office there. Very comfortable. It's very central. Very easy to go downtown. 20 minutes. Very easy to get to different parts of the city. We were looking at downtown, but I'm so happy we're at that location. Yeah. It's very easy to we'll operate out of there. That's hilarious. We're looking at the same area because it's so accessible, right? You have two yes. major highways uh, crossing each other. It's exactly. right right there. So you can head down to the core as quickly as you need to or anywhere else in the city, really. Um, come visit cool. us, man. Come yeah, we got to come check it out, there's definitely. There's unit available in that building. So oh, yeah? You guys should come check it out. Yeah, we should definitely check it out. Yeah. But uh, no, this is fantastic. Like, right when we saw, the, saw this, like, it looked so cool, the presentation, because you really bring it on a TV and you yes. show people, hey, this is a model. People instantly can see what can be done with it. Yeah. You know, just if it's just a cool factor of moving around and checking it out to like the application we built on top. Yes, exactly. Yeah. There is so much. We get the excitement factor with this software is so amazing. When mm -hmm. we present this to property developers, I, I'm not kidding you. I've met with CEOs of multi-billion dollar property development yeah. companies. And I get explicatives all the time. It's crazy. People just unleash. They're like, holy, this is amazing. Bleep, bleep, bleep. Oh yeah, my yeah, God. yeah, yeah. If I would have had this before, this would have you know, changed my whole presentation and sales. Because this video game technology now is just shaking up the whole prop tech world, right? Yeah. In 2008, there was like, uh, I think, $8 million invested in prop tech. And now in 2018, there was over $4 billion invested just in property technology. And that's what the sector we're in is prop tech and the video game now technology is starting to just totally, you know, uproot the whole, the whole thing. It's changing the whole environment no, because now what you can showcase with video game technology is just, it's what they want, right? Instead of paying $65,000 for a physical model, now you can get a, a, a realistic VR view where you can carry that with you, right? Wherever you go, you can have it in the cloud. And that just gives them so much more availability to showcase their properties and to the public as well, right? It's no, amazing. absolutely. Um, so when it comes to like scaling this, like computing wise, like sure. um, are you guys working with a team? Like are, are you remote serving it? Like how do you how do you uh, how do you scale an idea that takes so much computing nowadays? Sure, it's, right. That's a really good question. circling back to before. Yeah. Right? So I'm actually in contact with uh, Unreal Engine, which is owned by Epic Games. Yep. And we've actually applied for a grant. They set aside $100 million wow. of money, of grant money, free money, wow. to people using Unreal Engine to do cool and, and cutting edge stuff. So we actually applied for a million dollar grant from them. Wow. And now we're in the second round of conversations. We're just waiting to hear back from them. And also I've written to their CEO of Unreal Engine because we're starting that conversation. They've already developed some major games like Fortnite, right? Fortnite. Yeah is one of the major games which has over 150 million users worldwide. So they have the platform. So we wanna get advice from them of how we should build our platform to accommodate for millions of users. Likewise, we're part of IBM Venture Labs. We're part of yeah. their accelerator program. We already have a meeting actually next week. It just happened today. I just got a meeting with their chief technology guy for their cloud-based uh, computing system. So we wanna go check with them how their cloud-based system, how we might be able to work with that yeah. so that we can set up that cloud-based system. If they have a good platform for us to use, then that would be a great partnership, right? No, so we have to accommodate. That's not something we're gonna create. We're gonna have to work with a partner like IBM or Unreal Engine that already has their platforms or Amazon or Microsoft. 
a big company that has a good solid platform in place because we don't we want we're building a system for we think millions tens of millions of users eventually so we have to think about that you know it's not just creating an application it's like what's going to happen when there's a thousand people in this environment and it can't handle it it has to be able to self-replicate right yeah just like these other environments they self-replicate and create instances of those applications so you can have thousands and thousands and thousands of people running that same environment at the same time. No, that's great. Yeah. One of the things I, um, that we hear about now a lot is uh, how the next big search engine is going to be a search engine for AI. Yes. It's going to be a, like a, a data search engine, right? So uh, a computing system like uh, an artificial intelligence or machine learning software should be able to pull a bunch of data sets as readily available from a certain source. And if you guys could become that kind of system, right, where it's like, it's like all this data is compiled together in a visual format as well, exactly. right? People cannot just like ask themselves, but ha actually create their own AI almost or a machine learning intelligence software to like map certain things out directly. So if a company is like, okay, we need to find a space, um, you know, in an international city like Amazon to build their HQ. Right, they can use real world data to figure out what's actually available. Exactly. Right, and where would it look or go like an actual like you know a temporary, like or like certain designs already pre-made for it, right? All these different com com uh, countries can now compete. Uh, companies can now compete on how the layout will work, right? That can happen very quickly exactly. and be deployed very quickly, and. Man, there's so many applications. <laughs> yeah, there's, it's, it's mind-boggling. Yeah. We've got to keep ourselves focused because we've got to keep money coming in to build the platform. But you're right. It's, yeah. It is mind-blowing, right? Yeah. And that's what we see is people are more visual than they are yeah. data-driven. Like 75% yep. of people are not spatial. So like when they want to buy a home or see a condo, when they look at a 2D plan, right, some people can visualize it, but most people can't. Mm -hmm. And what we believe is the next step to the Internet is having a 3D experience, right? where you can visually navigate and I see agree. things in 3D and interact with it. And just like you're saying, having that data available too, and that's what we want to be part of is creating those 3D experiences, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially when you have a whole city. Now you can play with the whole city. And I told Raza a year ago today, I said, eventually we're going to be selling virtual real estate, right? Yeah. Because once this system's online and you have millions of people coming to it, then everybody's going to want to have their business in the VR, right? Because you're going to have that foot traffic, mm -hmm. right? To that yeah, the, the experience. digital foot, foot traffic. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I totally get it, man. But um, so a lot of applications here, yes. yes. That's night mode? It is. It, we actually are, our developer built this so that it, it constantly is moving timeline. Oh, nice. And then it has the, it, it gets a little bit darker here. That's amazing. Yeah. So we have we actually have a seasons pack. We just developed our lead developer just developed the seasons pack so we can show snow falling, rain, wind, leaves falling. We have a whole <laughs> pack we're building in now too because our goal is to make it like you see these shadows here. Yeah. The big thing with property developers is they have to show shadow fall, right? Yep. And for cities too, right? How is this? No, how like? accurate is that? It's very accurate. 100% because you built the model of how the sun is exactly. traveling. So now Jeez. that's that's what our next step is to implement how the different seasons will impact the shadow fall based on the sun's position in the sky because okay. that changes all year round. So we're building that into our framework so that we can have a hyper realistic experience of that too. Great. Yeah. So yeah, let's touch back on why solving this problem and why a visual da uh, database that can manipulate it. Um, sure. Where does the idea, where was it born from? Yes. So the idea was actually born, you know, I'll be, re I'll be honest yep. with you. Um, Raza and I are both part of uh, charitable pursuits. So I've been okay. part of a charitable organization for 16 years. Okay. And Raza has been doing uh, charitable activities. He's actually helped uh, sponsor now thousands and thousands of orphans along with other people in the Middle East and different areas around the world. That's his passion is to help with orphans, right? Because he, he, he does, he does not like to see, uh, you know, orphans in need or lacking somewhere. So he's actually traveling this December um, over to the Middle East part to help with uh, orphans who need school supplies, who need shelter, you know, and support. So we actually, big part of our first conversation when we met was our charitable work that we do, and that's why we connected. So behind the business pursuits, we want to build a very big company so that we have a lot of money to do charitable activities as well. That's what's behind it. Amazing. So we both have a, you know, the carrot for us, as you can say, is not only designing a company that can solve 
uh, uh, you know, solve problems and help people visualize better and help cities develop, but it's to generate this revenue to also help people in need around the world. No, absolutely. That's really what's behind it. And that gives so much energy, right? Uh, because absolutely. when you know you can allocate some of that money and resources to actually do these charitable projects, it gives you that much more energy to be successful and really focus yourself. I agree completely. I think we're very united in the kind of uh, in that kind of cause yeah. mentality where uh, this is something that I worry about all the time, right? Like we're in such a changing uh, changing society right now where AI and these like the, for the fourth industrial wave um, is pretty much hitting us. Fourth industrial revolution, right? Yes. And not everyone is benefiting from it because you still have to be within the nations that then have access to technology and. Um, to be able to be in, be a player, let alone have the capability to um, develop things uh, to, to to do these kind of things, right? So, yes. the nature of work is changing. The nature of like how people uh, how people live and like the living expenses are changing, right? And people are feeling it, yes. right? Uh, like one of the things they like um, I listen to is like how analysts are like developing models, kind of like yours, but more on, on, a, on a, like more on like a uh, and numbers basis, right? Like how the economy is being shaped because of machines changing and stuff. And like a lot of change is happening, but it's not going to benefit the people who need the most. Yes. Exactly. Right. If anything, it is a potential to uh, like technology has the potential to make the rich richer and the poorer poorer, yes. and be used against people rather than for people. Um, and this has been like the worry about the the change, uh, the the current space of change right now, right? Who's actually has access to it? Who's benefiting from it? Yeah. And exactly. having like a cause aligned like that to help give back to people, I think it's super important for any company, for yeah. any organization, right? To sh uh, help shorten that gap. Yeah, there's definitely a responsibility we have to take. You know, they they say in our generation, you know, I'm 39. I'm sure you're you're younger than I am. I yeah. Think. Uh, but the younger generation is very aware about this mm -hmm. too, right? We, we there's a social responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in the ocean, right? We have a a, a, a Texas size. Yep. You know, state like Texas of plastic floating in our ocean. What are we going to do about that, right? Yeah. How much do we really think about that? Yeah. There's companies like Flow Water that have created a paper tetra pack that is 100% recyclable, and now they've just solved a solution for plastic water bottles. Don't use them anymore. Yeah. Use the water that you have a paper 100% recycle and recycle, right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. same thing. We have to be socially conscious about what we're doing. And with our company as, as well, where it can't just be, I want to use this company. I want to make billions of dollars. I want to buy a, you know, $200 million house. I mean, God bless everybody who's doing that. But our goal as a society is to help each other. We have to be cognizant that whatever I do is going to impact all my fellow, you know, citizens, all my fellow brothers and sisters in the community. Mm -hmm. So I should have a positive impact for society, right? I have to think about what am I doing? How is that affecting everybody else? And think about the future generations, right? There's been so many things done where we've 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 done so many things and now we're like, oh gosh, carbon emissions, right? Like I've been to some foreign countries like New Delhi, you know, after four hours you're walking out and you can rub the soot off your hand because they half the cars don't have catalytic converters, right? Yeah. So what are we doing to our world? How are we impacting society by you know, by the choices that we're making with our companies? And it's every day there's choices that we make, right? Is it to be greedy and to, to benefit ourselves, or is it to benefit, you know, society and help people? So we should really think about how we're focusing our, you know, our intentions, right? It's all about intention. Right. And I mean, that's very, that's very noble. Um, and before we started this, I mean, you talked about this journey you've been in the last like 20 years to like give back and be more mindful of things, right? Um, let's just, let's get more into that. Cause that's, that's, that's sure, interesting, sure. right? As, as a person, like, so where did all this start from? Like uh, this whole mindset of giving back and providing for people. Uh, I, I, like, do you see this as a vehicle more to solve a problem or a vehicle that can gain some revenue that you can use to solve the problem you want, AKA help other people? Yeah. So I truly believe that this idea is, you know, it's something that's, it's gonna happen whether Raza and mm. I do it ourselves or somebody else, it's just gonna happen. Gotcha. It's like the MP3 player. I remember before the MP3 player came out, I had the same idea. It came up in my mind. I was 14 years old and I had this idea, but I, I yeah. didn't know what to do with it. Yep. I realized that there were sound files I, rec I could record on my computer, a five minute song. And instead of being 50 megabytes like it was on the CD, it was only five megabytes. Yeah. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could carry my computer around and have thousands of songs right on a single disc, but I didn't know how to do it. Yeah. It's the same thing. This idea of what's coming 
we feel that this is an idea that's coming, but it's been given to us to use and to do. Somebody else is going to do it, like I said, if we don't. But we have the opportunity to use those resources and to help other people benefit. So it works together. It's going to solve problems in society. It's going to help visualize. It's going to help people visualize. It's on the cutting edge of technology, so it's growing mm -hmm. technology. But at the same end, at the back end, we're going to be able to use those funds to help you know, people around the world. Like several years ago, Raza yeah. started, you know, they just, they started giving um, donations to orphans around the world, right? There was just five or 10. Uh, actually, he started, I can't remember, I think it was 414, I think it was, or 313. Uh, he's going to remind me after this yeah. podcast. 313 uh, original orphans that were benefited. And now there's been thousands and thousands of orphans, right? He started Jeez. this from scratch. Yeah. Likewise, I'm part of an organization called Unity of Man, which our headquarters are based out of India. We have a headquarters that we founded now in Toronto. And we do a lot of... Uh, charitable pursuits we help we have a blind home for the blind in india we have a charitable hospital we sponsor two public schools we have various uh, charitable pursuits that we do and so i've been donating to that cause likewise we do homeless distributions here in toronto we help with various causes here so that's really what powers my mind business without having an ideal to give back and help other people for me it, it's just it's not exciting right for me yeah. it's exciting to take something to use technology but use whatever is gained from that to help other people that's what's exciting mm -hmm. right? and same for raza that's really why we connected so that's great yeah. i mean definitely definitely love the sediment right do you have a model for how you would want to help people uh, is that something you want to develop in the future um, how do we I look do like? actually we yeah. have a um, so for the organization I'm part of yeah um, we actually have a very groundbreaking project we're going to be doing in the GTA so this is I've never told this in on a public broadcast before so yeah. you guys are the first to hear this but okay we're actually going to be developing uh, a very special school for children okay which is going to be using the latest uh, teaching techniques such as Montessori techniques um, to teach the children about um, all the different cultures of the world. So children from any religion will be able to go to the school. It'll be a love-based school. They'll get to learn about the different cultures of the, of the different and different religions around the world. So they have an open heart. And likewise, there's going to be a year-round greenhouse where they learn gardening and ecology. So they'll be in touch with nature. They'll learn how to garden, how to clean up nature, how to pro how nature can provide. They'll have different stuff such as uh, solar energy, geothermal energy, wind energy, so that they can learn about the different technologies for working with the environment and creating a more sustainable future. But at the base of it will be the ideal that, you know, it was said by a great person that at the end of all knowledge is the ideal that we should use this knowledge to help other people, mm -hmm. right? This is the highest knowledge is that we should use our knowledge and education to help other people. So that'll be the model of the school. There'll be extracurricular activities where the children can apply their knowledge, whether to help a community that's somewhere in India or Africa or South America or even locally, right? Let's say there's a senior's home and they need a garden built. These students can use their knowledge and information now to go build a garden or even a greenhouse for the senior community or a, a community at need. So the ideal would be not just teaching the children extracurricular activities for themselves, but to use that knowledge you know, practically to help people around the world. When you're able to apply knowledge in a way like that to help yeah. other people, it's just it's very magical and powerful, right? Children get very excited about that too. No, absolutely. And I mean, uh, touching on that subject, I mean, you can definitely use 3D scapes exactly for, to do all this, facilitate exactly. all this, to like, show what it's going to look like, right? To not just show how it looks like, to like have a, even like a virtualized experience just like that for few other people. Yes. All right. So a school they can come and learn as well, meet each other. And you know, an online-based school, but actually a virtual reality, it's a good right? Idea, man. But also is a knowledge transfer, right? Yes. People from more established regions being able to look back and seeing how the impoverished city works and functions. Mm -hmm. If you can do this with that kind of city and get like the first the minds from the first world who have who have access to all this information, can help rebuild the impoverished, yes. right? By yes. seeing what's actually boots on the ground, what's actually going on there help with the transfer of knowledge, train them from the ground up to what they can be doing, right? Monitor their progress, yes, feedback, exactly. uh, give direct feedback, right? So, uh, like, I think that's how only, only way poverty really will change Yes, is when you find a way to make some money, Yeah, right? Exactly. I mean, charity can only go so far. It's a band-aid to, uh, the, it's a band-aid to, like, uh, 
the symptoms of poverty, but to actually take someone out, lift out of poverty, you got to create wealth. Yeah, you have to empower them to be mm. able to stand on their own feet and develop, you know, in that community and develop that whole community, right? Right. It makes sense. I've traveled to India a lot of times, and I've seen the poorest of the poorest people. Mm -hmm. I'm just amazed by that we still have this kind of poverty in our world, right? In different parts of Africa, South America, India, you know, Yemen, there's many parts of the world where poverty is, yeah. you know, here we're very blessed, right? I mean, when you come back to Canada and you're mm -hmm. like, my land, this is like a heaven, you know, compared to most places in the world. I mean, yeah. outwardly, it's, it's, it's very heavenly what we have. But we do have to empower different communities around the world, you know, to, to help them, right? And to you know, set a good example of how we're using our richness here to help empower those communities to come up as well. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and, you know, it takes me back because I was really fortunate to take like a really good like uh, urban studies or a city studies uh, course when I was in oh, university. Wow. I took it as like a, you know, a random elective. I thought it'd be like very easy, but it turned to be very interesting. Um, and in it, they talked about how slums, um, people who grew up in slums, mm -hmm. right, actually become very entrepreneurial, very innovative. And because of that culture, cities can gradually transform from there, right? So yes. New York City used to be a slum. Like, exactly. like there used to be like tenant people just made, made like like in the shelters themselves. And uh, New York City had paved them down and create actual ho housing. Yes. But the way they did it was like by empowering the local people, by tearing down their properties, but then building properties and giving it to them, mm -hmm. right? By actually producing, by giving them... Um, ability to transact by giving them infrastructure, yes. access to infrastructure um, is the biggest thing. Yes. And it took New York a long time, but because of that, now New York is New York. Exactly. Right? Being able to produce and uh, have that kind of productivity that it has with that much like ability to uh, like hold as much people as it does. But um, same thing with like London, same thing with Rome, mm -hmm. right? These were all slums that became empires, that became their own financial centers of the world. Um, mostly because these like highly competitive uh, uh, places where resources are lacking, people are very competing for like all resources. You put some kind of infrastructure in place, yes, and that same kind of mentality kind of drives them to create more and exactly. to build up. Yeah, you're right? giving they're giving them something to work with, right? right? And, just, yeah. and I always thought about that too. I'm like provide that infrastructure when it when it comes cheap enough, when it comes the when it comes more visible enough, like people can look here and see oh. Putting a school here, this is how it's going to affect this community. Exactly. You know, putting this road is going to increase traffic to create this kind of business, yes. right? Putting Wi-Fi towers will empower these minded people, right? And if you can invest in these projects and figure out a way to actually make some capital back, yes, that's it. Exactly. Right? If you can grow people out of poverty and find out how to make money for the people who do that, yes, exactly. <laughs> that's it. You got a you, win win, right? Yeah, win -win you, that's it. You figure it out. So that's that's really exciting. You guys are on this path. Yes. I, I like uh, it's something that I'm really interested in as well. And uh, please let us know if there is any charities or any kind of uh, things you work with right now that we can also uh, let our viewers know about when we do post our web uh, post your episode up. Sure. Right. So any kind of causes or anything you guys are a part of, um, we'll definitely attach that to. But uh, this has been great. Okay. Thank Man, you so much. Thank for you for joining me, me and uh, talking about all this.